Hi, and welcome to, to the second video introduction for hands-on scientific computing. My name is Essi, and I work at Aalto Science IT, teaching and communications, which means that I am connecting new researchers and new users to existing resources. I'm here with Richard, who can introduce himself. Yeah, I'm Richard Darst. I work, I also work at Aalto Science IT. And well, well, like Essie, my interest these days are usability and teaching and helping everyone to use the resources that we provide. In this video, we will be referring to a survey conducted on scientific computing, where one question was, what do you know now about scientific computing that you wish someone had taught you when you began as a researcher or a student? Yeah. And this question really lets you see what kind of things that are sort of implicitly learned by people without being taught in courses, which are really important for your career. So hopefully this will give you a lot of good things to think about. There were 66 answers to that question, and I have picked up some of them to talk about in the hope of them being helpful for someone who is just starting out. First answer that caught my eye was, scientific computing should be introduced earlier on the studies. It is basically mandatory, so that should be brought up. The leap from tiny Python scripts to scientific computing with large datasets is huge and quite intimidating, especially for an undergraduate student. So, what? would you suggest for a person who is now moving from courses into research? What should they first pay attention to in order to keep up? Wow, that's a big question to start with. It is. I don't know, maybe in part, all of the other questions that we answer sort of relate to those. But I think maybe the biggest differences are the scale and the independence of what you're doing. So you're not being told here do this and you're told use these tools and then you do it and come back but you're given a general problem and you need to find the right tools in order to do it and a lot of this involves things like managing your data or code and then also spending time learning the tools that you need in order to solve the problem at the same time you're actually doing the problem then there were quite many repeating answers saying how to use the computing resources, how to access resources in practice and use them for computing. I still have a feeling that I do not know enough about practicalities, how to use all possible opportunities and how to Google properly. So how could these people be advised to find suitable resources for them? And how does one learn to find information efficiently? Wow. So, okay, that's a sort of interesting question. So I sort of interpret this as saying, like, oftentimes people may be working and, you know, you do your courses, you have your laptop, and then you start doing research. And do you keep using your laptop? Or do you, like, I know there's been some people who've done a lot of work on their laptop and then realize, oh, I have a cluster that I is much faster and I didn't know about it. And well, for that, we have different courses and things which can introduce to you the resources and also how to use them. But, you know, a lot of it is also before you go and immediately start working on a problem, think about, like, do some searches. What is available? Like, what do we provide for free? And what do we support? Um, on the also scientific computing pages, we have a lot of lists of different things and you can find a good page at Alto called, let's see, IT resources for research or IT services for research. Um, yeah, and then also go and ask your friends and other people doing things like ask, okay, so what are, like, what are you using to do your computing? And maybe that's even a, the best way to Learn, learn from each other. Maybe we could talk about what the different general categories are. So one first category is your own laptop, whether it's your own or provided by the university. Mm -hmm. 
or own desktop. So this is good because it's easy and you have full control, but doesn't really have as much power as other things and it doesn't really scale up. So if you can make a program run on your own thing in your own editor, there's a big gap between that and the cluster. Yeah. And there's different remote resources, whether it's remote desktops or remote servers you can connect to and then run there. And then finally, there are the computer clusters where you connect there, you run there. You have to script it, but once you script it, then you can run very many things at once. So instead of running, like starting five copies of your program, you write a batch script and then you start 500 copies of your program. All right, and then we had the following comment. You generally need less computational power than you expect. Is this true? And why do people usually get the impression that scientific computing requires huge computational resources? Yeah, that's a sort of interesting question, especially given that the previous answer was you might need to use a cluster that you can do things more often. Yeah. And I think maybe there's two aspects here. First is the fact that the one processor on the cluster is not necessarily that much more powerful than one processor on your computer. The power of the cluster is that you can do things many times. So basically, you can write the script to run your code over and over again with many different parameters or on many different data sets or things like that. So really, the difficulty is not that you need one processor that's a lot more powerful, but you need to be able to use the processors better or maybe write your code so that it uses less memory or less time and runs faster. So basically, it's more about your own skills than the computer power you need. And then in those cases that you do need more computer power, well, you also need the skills in order to use it. So once you're running things 500 times, you really have to make sure that your own code is reasonably fast and not doing things that are just slow for no reason and so on. And that also doesn't mean you have to spend forever optimizing things because at some point it's better to let the computer run it because the computer is cheaper than your own brain, but there's some balance there. Yeah, and just to remind our viewers that you don't have to use time optimizing your programs to perfection. Those might never be perfect, but they need to run and be correct to be changed when needed. Yeah, that's a good point about being correct because there's far more problems with things being wrong and then having to do it again. So what's the next? And next we have a fancy word, parallel coding. And somebody wished that they knew that parallelizing your script can be as simple as running the same script multiple times with different input data sets. From this, I thought that how does one know whether learning parallel computing is worth the effort and how big stuff should one be running? Yeah, that's a really good question. Like, when is it worth the effort? Now, to be honest, I have not done that much parallel programming myself. I've done some where it's needed, but these days I think it's very much different than 10 or 20 years ago. So first off, I think most people need to realize that most of the parallel coding is not that fancy. It's called embarrassingly parallel, which means instead of making one program that can use 500 processors, you make one program that runs 500 times each on one or a few processors. And this goes right back to the scripting and automation of things. So second is that these days, oftentimes there's other libraries that do the parallelness for you. So for example, if you're doing a simulation, maybe the simulation package makes in parallel for you. Or if you're doing numerical stuff, then Python's NumPy library does it in parallel for you. And then in this case, it's not so much about knowing how to do it yourself, but knowing what it's doing. So that way you can control it properly and have it work well. One common problem is that people will run code and say, okay, I need 10 processor for, processors for this. And then it uses one, or it tries to use 40 and is inefficient. 
because they don't know how to run it on the cluster the right way. Yeah. So once you do start doing things in parallel yourself, there's two main methods. One is shared memory or the open MP model, which means it's running on one computer and using multiple processors. The second one is message passing, which basically lets it run on multiple computers and send data back and forth between the computers. So both have structured ways of doing things. So you're not really making things all from scratch. And of these, the shared memory or open MP isn't that difficult overall and is enough for many problems these days because one computer has so much memory and processors that, well, it can really solve most problems. So I might recommend just looking at your own programming languages and seeing a little bit about how things are done in parallel there. Um, both the basics and some of the more advanced methods, but don't worry too much about it right now. So when the time comes, then you can use it and also you'll know how to use the other libraries that do run this and how to control them properly. And next we have environments. Some people left these comments. Environment preparation and basic stuff such as installing software using Conda environment. Environments play a part in reproducibility of research, but in a nutshell, what kind of issues can easily be avoided when getting used to using environments? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I'd say that without a doubt, most of our support issues these days come from people needing to install their own software. So I'll let this be a lesson to everyone. So once you start making software that other others use, spend some time making it easily installable or else no one will use it and you've just wasted your time. So environments like, okay, so first off, learn how your own software environment works. So for example, Python, which many people use these days, there's pip that installs packages and it's important to know how this works. But then also there's a concept of environment or virtual environments as they're called in Python which means that instead of taking and installing software for your whole, whole user, which will be shared by everything, for every project you have, you have only one environment and you install software inside of that. So for example, project A has virtual environment B and so on. And this is really important because what you do for one project won't interfere with the other projects. Also, it sort of makes these environments uh, like, throw away or reproducible. So if you ever get a problem, you can delete the whole environment and try to install things again. This has two good effects. One, when something goes wrong, you can start over without, having, without breaking every single project you're doing. And second, once you can reproduce it and make it again, then that means you can sort of test how it works. So make it, like make it where other people can do it. And like when you see there's problems coming up, find them early rather than in five years when you're trying to run things again. Yeah. There's also the concept of when you're installing things, choosing the versions of things you install. So that way you can go back in time. Like, Do you want a new version of say TensorFlow when it gets released to break all of your own code because it does something new? So you can install the exact version you need and then um, keep it the same as you're doing your project until the point you're ready to upgrade. So most modern programming languages have some way of doing this, both managing the dependencies that you need and then taking the versions and then installing them in isolated environments. So whatever it is, take some time and learn about it. Yeah, and I would also like to mention here that maybe some people already are on a more advanced level. So how about containerized workflows for environments? Yeah, so the concept of a container is that it's practically like the whole operating system put into a single file, which can be run. So this is great because you're able to basically set up your environment and then copy it from computer to computer and you don't have to reinstall things. 
So if you know how to do that, it might be useful in some cases, but I think in many cases, being able to make the Conda environment or the virtual environment or something like that, being able, like, being able to um, make that reproducible is more useful and more important than being able to make the new, the whole container as an operating system, at least for science where our tasks are, well, not as difficult as say running Amazon or something like that. Uh, the next one is a very interesting one. When to do new things by myself versus when to reuse what others have done. Because I think the schools teach us something very different than what it is actually like in the real life. Yeah, like when you take a class, if you went and you found, oh, someone else has solved my problem for me, I'm going to use this to do my assignment, then you're cheating or something like that. Exactly. And that's bad. But when you're doing research, if someone else has already solved it, then it's not research, it's just doing something that someone else has already done. So you need to be able to use these other good libraries people have made. So whether it's something that's really big and important, like say NumPy or TensorFlow or Pandas, or like there's many of these very common packages which make the basic data structures and data handling and simulations and computations easy. But there's also these small things. Like if you're doing things that someone else has done in another paper and they've released their code, you need to be able to take their code and reuse it in order to well, both check what they've done and then extend it to do more things yourself. And these are two very different tasks. The first one using the big packages is sort of knowing the best practices and reading documentation. The second one is being able to look at someone else's code and determine, is this even correct? Is it even something I should be reusing? Or am I gonna try to use this and then realize it's full of bugs and then have to find something else myself? So, well, really this depends on what language you're using and how you do things, well, how you do things yourself, but it's something that you should think about. So being able to well, I'd say, for now, before you start reusing something, before you start doing something, see what you can reuse. And then before you start reusing it, take a little look at it and decide, is this stable enough and reusable enough for me to do? And you can often figure that out by looking at the documentation and install instructions and example use cases and things like that. Yeah, and also keeping in mind that it's the perfect learning opportunity because you actually have to think that how are you going to apply somebody else's code to your own code? So you really have to know your own code throughout. Yeah. And also a learning opportunity because you see what you need to do in your own code to make it where other people can use it or even yourself can use it five years from now. Like when something's missing from someone else's documentation, maybe make sure you write it down for yourself yeah, and so on. Exactly. All right, and then setting up workflows and pipelines. Hmm. So let's see. So the idea of workflow and pipeline is basically that instead of running things by hand, you somehow make it automatic where you can run one command and then all your work is done. So that's sort of like some magical dream ideal, which doesn't happen for many people. But the opposite case, where you have a bunch of scripts and they have to be run in the right order to get the results, then in six months when you have to do things again because you need to update it for the next version of your paper and you don't remember what you did, that's a really bad situation to be in. And I've seen many people get there. So I guess the main lesson is at least try to script things a little bit. So write down what you've done, uh, script things a little bit. So you can run, run one script that runs multiple commands. And if things get advanced enough, there's these workflow automation tools, which can basically understand what all the steps are and rerun everything in the right order when the code or data has changed. And well, 
yeah, when you, I think many people don't get there, but it's something mm -hmm. important to be aware that it exists. Yeah. And then we have how to manage my data and code. I think this is a topic that is not at all paid attention to in the courses or in your undergraduate or even graduate studies. Yeah, well, a good question. I mean, I guess in courses, after you do an, an assignment, you don't need to do it again. So mm. like, there's not this concept of keeping track of stuff for a long term and so on. Yeah. So um, well, when you're a researcher, then you do things for what, three to five years or well, even longer than if you aren't able to find the stuff you've done before, you have a really major problem. So, well, everyone will have your own style. So, um, you know, talk to your friends and colleagues and see what they do and use the best practices. So I guess version control is one of the most important things for managing code and possibly small data. At least you want to minimize copying and pasting. There's this one concept called single source of truth, which means instead of having like maybe copy and then modifying both and they're all doing slightly different things but they're all somehow related make sure that you know the master place where everything you do is and try to have the fewer number of master places for example on my all of my computers i have one directory called git and that's where all of my projects go these days so if I need to find something, I don't need to look in my data directory and my projects directory in this and that. There's just one, git. Mm -hmm. And then if I need to synchronize this or need to find something on another computer, I know there's one place to look, either GitHub or GitLab, depending on what I'm doing. Um, yeah, but then you'll, you'll sort of find your own style. So there may be big data that can't be in git. So mm -hmm. you need to keep this organized a different way. When you're working with other people as a team, it also becomes quite difficult. So I can't, I honestly can't tell you what you should do, but I can tell you don't do things without thinking about it a little bit at the start and discussing with the people on your team. Okay. And last but not least, we have how to write in a reusable manner. I think first we should define the issue here. Yeah, what I think this means is that, or at least from my experience, I start working on a single project and I do a bunch of work for it and I'll have some code and data and things like that. And then I start another project. And then do I start project number two from scratch or can I use everything I did in project one easily within project two? And as you go on making these kind of things you can reuse in each project is really a key to productivity and efficiency, and also doing things correctly and enjoying your work. So what I found here works well for me. I start one project and I don't really know what I'm doing. So I just do things. But over time I see, okay, this is a common task which I'm going to be able to reuse. So I take that and then I split it off into another directory and make this another module which can be imported into my other code. So in Python, this is easy. There's modules like that. These days, I would also take it and make it a installable Python package, which can be installed in my other environments and modified. Mm -hmm. But then once you do this, so you sort of keep in mind there's a difference between the code for one particular project you have and then code which is reused and used among multiple projects. And the multi-project code, you spend more effort in documenting that and making it standardized and like actually working and things like that. And then you accept that things for one project, well, you do a bunch, but you don't spend as much time on it. But then also within the code, instead of making say one giant script, you need to be able to use things, functions or modules and so on which can be split out into these kinds of things. Once you start doing that, it's also really important. How do you make this um, interface, which is stable and reusable? 
And these are things that are not really taught in many courses. I mean, maybe it might be if you take software engineering courses, but probably most people watching this video are not software engineers. And that's not your goal. Your goal is to do some other kind of science or research where you're basically learning a lot of this yourself. Yeah. So, well, I guess in the video description that you'll see, we'll have some links to some other resources here. So maybe it's really important to learn that you're not alone. So talk to your friends and colleagues, talk to the staff, us at Science IT, and we can give you some advice and make sure things are going in a good direction. Um, yeah. And always keep learning. Exactly. So please keep on going through the material on handsonspicom.readthedocs.io and some additional info about science IT and upcoming training can be found on spicom.alto.fi. All right, thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.